George M. Cohan, uh, who lived from 1878 to 1942, a uh, pretty big figure both as a songwriter, also as an actor, a director, uh, a designer, uh, kind of a one-man show, and he kind of didn't hesitate to let folks know. He, uh, he would like you to think that he was born on the 4th of July. He was not. He was born on the 3rd of July in a hotel room in Providence, Rhode Island, another of these people who were the children of traveling vaudeville performers. Um, in his case, he got his big start playing the baby Jesus on stage uh, as a live infant in a Christmas uh, vaudeville sketch that was put together uh, very early on in his life. Um, he became a part of a family group called the Flying Cohans. They were part dance, part acrobatic kind of act. And after a very short time, it became very, very apparent that uh, Cohan was such a natural and that he knew so much about so many different aspects of the theater that he would muscle his way to the top, even with his own family group. And you would see, archivally speaking, you can see an awful lot of uh, material, programs, for example, for shows, where the show is written by George M. Cohan, starring Cohan, directed by Cohan, choreographed by Cohan, uh, lighting designed by Cohan, everything done by the same person. Um, not the most humble character. Not the tallest characters stood under five foot six, very tough, pugnacious looking fellow with a bit of an Irish accent because most of his family had come straight from Ireland before he was born and they all held on to their accent and to their Irish brogue a little bit. Um, very, very populist kind of person. Really believed that the theater did not need to be something that you needed to get dressed up to go and see that instead it should be for all people, and that all uh, types of people, all races of people, all economic situations, everybody should be able to come to the theater. And that the theater should not necessarily be about high elevated topics, such as what were going on in some of the operettas, in his opinion. He felt that the operettas were too fancy, that they were not American enough, and that they didn't really have anything to say that people cared about. He thought the one thing people really cared about was America. There was no shortage of patriotic material in a George M. Cohan show. You might see the Statue of Liberty herself tap dancing across the stage. You're going to see Uncle Sam and a whole chorus of people in Uncle Sam costumes. And then Cohan himself bursting out to sing a song about America. Most of his songs were very simple, the way that they were written. Nothing high, nothing difficult to sing, no sweeping changes in key, marches. A lot of 2 4 stuff, and even 2 2 and 4 4 stuff. Um, one of his favorite writers was John Philip Sousa. Sousa, uh, author of Stars and Stripes Forever and a number of other popular, sort of patriotic, horn heavy, military sounding numbers for the, you know, songs like that. Um, he thought that's where America's real heart uh, should be artistically. Cohen is responsible for writing a group of songs that I think a lot of elementary school kids learn. Uh, in some cases, probably because they, again, are not very difficult to sing, and they speak to things that are sort of universally patriotic or, or such. Um, it's Cohen who wrote, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Not to be confused with Yankee Doodle itself, um, which is a much older song. Uh, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy also becomes the, uh, the title song for a film in which Mr. Cohen is played by James Cadney. Um, he wrote, You're a Grand Old Flag, which you may have sung a time or two on uh, Flag Day or at some point in, in grammar school. Um, he was the author of the, song, of the music and lyrics to Give My Regards to Broadway, which is viewed by many as a sort of like unofficial anthem of Broadway entertainment. And he also wrote Over There, which is a very popular, was a very popular song during World War I, one of these rallying cries about how the United States were going to pull through and be extraordinarily, extraordinarily successful over there. Uh, Cohan loved America, loved baseball, by the way, is rumored to have been one of the people involved with the uh, betting on the rigged World Series of 1919. Um, never was necessarily uh, caught or, or, or connected with that. Um, as an entertainer, as a playwright, as a composer, as a lyricist, he did a great deal for bringing the common man back to the theater. You know, you're going to hear a song that I'm going to have linked to this uh, module, and it's not one of these up here, it's another one. It's called, although many of his songs are similar, you hear uh, songs that have some of the same words in them. The song I have linked is called uh, I Want to Hear a Yankee Doodle Tune. And the reason it's interesting is because if you listen to it very carefully, first of all, you'll hear it's Cohan himself singing. 
As a singer, I'll just say he was a great dancer. Um, he's got a very, very distinctive sort of voice that you'll hear. Um, but the song basically says, I want the only kind of song I can understand, a, an American Yankee Doodle type march. I don't need a fancy operetta. In fact, he takes shots right in the song at some of the other guys across town, uh, your, your people that we talked about earlier who are putting on these, these much larger and fancier and foreign sounding operettas. Um, Cohen had a very, uh, conservative isn't quite the word because that's come to have a sort of different connotation, but certainly a very jingoistic and patriotic outlook on life, but also an incredibly positive one. And he was massively popular. He really did have a great deal of success in, in that he brought theater to all types of people and influenced all sorts of people. He became a really an, an early pioneer in the idea of developing a book musical, a musical that had a plot. We kind of lost that. I mean, Gilbert and Sullivan were doing that, and we kind of pasted some things together with those spectaculars. Vaudeville, of course, doesn't do that. But out of Vaudeville, where the flying Cohans were, comes Cohan saying, much like Houdini, I need a full two hours to do my thing. I can't just be an act in a sea of other acts. I need, um, you know, I, I need my own two hours worth of material. And so to that end, he winds up uh, putting on these giant all-American extravaganzas that people uh, flock to and, and, and that do extraordinarily well. Uh, Cohan was very, very good to an awful lot of his actors and performers. Perhaps that explains why he might have been so, uh, why he might have had such a hard time with the actor's strike, the one that I was referring to in the previous part of tonight's lecture. Um, the equity strike of 1919 basically said that actors were not being treated very well and that they needed to, well, to refuse to perform. And that it, all the theaters going dark was the one way that they could get the attention of America. Now, Cohan was not particularly unfair to any of his actors. He paid his people well, and because they were doing one show in one location, they weren't subject to some of the problems that the vaudevillians had um, when they were doing a Cohan show. And so he kind of, perhaps naively, uh, felt that his casts would just come right on out and they would support him. Not so much the case. They, they said, you know, we, we have to do this, George. We like you, but you're management, and we are not going to perform that day. So Cohen showed up for a performance himself and discovered that there was literally no one else there and had to cancel, and took it very, very personally and became a little bit of a recluse and canceled the remainder of the run of his show even after the strike had been kind of resolved and sort of disappeared for a while and traveled and, and, and kind of felt that the theater had betrayed him and that it had passed him by and that there wasn't a place for him uh, any longer. That didn't always seem to be the case. It was not a two-sided uh, uh, feeling there. Um, President Roosevelt would eventually give Cohan the Medal of Freedom for all of his patriotic work and all of the songs that he produced. Eventually Cohan would return to the stage uh, in the 1940s, but by the time he did, his style of acting and everything that he had been doing was so dated and so corny and so sort of old-fashioned that there really wasn't much of a place for him. And so he wound up sort of re-retiring after a bit. Um, I want to tell you an interesting thing that uh, might kind of, well, it ties up with Cohen in the end, um, but, uh, but nonetheless, I think it's sort of a side, side journey here. If you are someone who wants to go to New York City today, and you are interested in seeing some, some live theater. And let's say that you don't care what you want to see. You just say, I want to see a show, it doesn't matter, I'm going to take my chances. Broadway houses hate to have empty seats, especially on nights when critics or reporters are coming to the theater to talk about how well the show is doing. And so, to that end, an awful lot of them will, at the last moment, release a lot of their seats in what they call rush tickets at half price. And you can go to a rush counter in New York and say, okay, what do you got today? And you take your chances and you might get half price tickets to a great show that's playing on that day. It just happens to have some empty seats they need filled. Um, interestingly, if you're in New York and you're looking for one of these rush counters, one of them is located directly across from a great big statue of George M. Cohen. And I like to think that there's George looking down on all of the people out there who can only afford half price tickets and saying, yeah, Shane, that's the way it ought to be. That's right, everybody getting a ticket. I'm sure he'd be happy to be a landmark to help him find that. 
George M. Cohan died in 1942 at the age of 64, uh, largely of complications from, uh, from pneumonia and some other things. Um, true story, he, in his hospital bed uh, in the 40s, he asked to be taken out and smuggled into a taxi by a nurse. He seemed to know that he was going to die, and he asked to just take a last ride around the Times Square Broadway area of New York. And at the time, with uh, other shows from Richard Rogers and a number of other people that were very successful, uh, out there in lights, and all sorts of people going to see all sorts of different kinds of shows, Cohan kind of said, yep, it looks like it turned out the way that I hoped that it would, and uh, later allowed himself to be sort of blanketed and smuggled back into his little hospital bed where he passed away. Um, kind of a sweet tale, kind of an interesting end. Uh, it's interesting that he died in 1942, because I also believe that if he, if he had just hung on just a tiny bit more, for America to really get involved in World War II, I am sure that the outburst of patriotism, of marches, of military music, of support for the country, he would have been back in his heyday again. It probably would have made a, a, a bundle as a sort of second renaissance. Nonetheless, his music did, and even after he had passed away in the 40s, stuff did catch back on again and became sort of um, a, a fad, the material that would be rearranged a little for swing styles and things, but was still pretty much Cohan saying, hooray for the common man, and uh, hooray for America. Cohan also is one of the earliest examples of, of a producer and also of a composer uh, having a signature style and getting that style put on Broadway and then contributing a series of shows uh, in that style. And in the coming modules that we're going to hear, work on and you're going to hear, um, a lot of them revolve around individual composers and their work, specifically people like Jerome Kern, uh, Richard Rogers, um, Cole Porter, ultimately even Stephen Sondheim, and a lot of them might say that they owe the idea of having this impresario, this one person who has such an influence over every aspect of the production, the classic example of that would have to be George M. Cohan. Um, as I said, you'll be uh, hearing a little bit of Cohan's music. I'm going to show you a little bit of a clip or send you a link to a clip about some vaudeville that I think you'll find interesting, and that will be the unit that we, uh, that we discussed today. Uh, the follow-up unit next time will be about Jerome Kern and probably one of the major uh, turning points uh, in the American musical, one of the major shows that really changes the game and changes the way we look at theater and the way the things theater does in return uh, for America. Uh, that show will be Showboat, and we'll talk more about that next time. So thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.